so yeah, but it's Good morning, everyone. Um, it's lovely to to be here at the um, the conference today. So thank you very much for the for the invitation for us to participate. Um, my name is Edgan Powell, and I have my colleague um, Johnny with me as well. We are both change makers at the Office of the Future Generations um, Commissioner for Wales. Trying to move on to the next slide. <laughs> Oh. Is that delay at your end or our end? Yeah, no, I think it's a delay at my end, I'm afraid. Hang on a minute. Right, am I sorry, am I on the next slide now? Yeah. Oh, fantastic, lovely. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, we, uh, we're we going to talk to you today about um, climate action and delivering net zero within the context of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Um, and we will highlight some examples at both the national and the local level in terms of um, the work that's going on in Wales. So, I mean, if I was in a room and I had faces in front of me, I'd be able to ask you, just out of interest, how many people have um, heard of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act or how many people are, are aware that we have one here in, here in Wales? Um, and I'd get a show of hands, but um, because I'm staring at my um, PowerPoint slides on a screen, I'm not able to do that. So I'm gonna work on the assumption that um, there might be some people who have heard of the Act, but the majority of you maybe um, are not that familiar. So I'll just give you a quick run through, really, of the um, the legislation itself. Um, so the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act was introduced um, in Wales back in 2015. Um, it requires 44 public bodies in Wales to um, essentially improve the social, environmental, economic, and cultural well-being of Wales. So to act in a manner that ensures we take um, the needs of the present um, without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So essentially the, the sustainable development principle. Um, and this is aimed at achieving the seven national wellbeing goals that you can see on the slide there. So these are for Wales to be um, a prosperous Wales, a more resilient Wales, a healthier, more equal Wales um, and a globally responsible Wales, etc. And as part of this, the public bodies also have to apply the five ways of working. And this is this includes thinking about the long term um, impact and um, in, uh, repercussions of the things that they do, as well as thinking about uh, integration and collaboration as well. The other thing the legislation has done is to establish an independent commissioner. Um, and that's who we work for, the Future Generations Commissioner for Wales. Um, so the Commissioner's role is to work with um, advising and monitoring Welsh Government and the other Welsh public bodies in terms of how they are implementing um, the Act. So just um, very quickly, this slide just explains um, a bit more coherently the, the kind of architecture of the Act. So you've got the seven national wellbeing goals across the top. Um, underneath those, um, where it talks about understanding Wales, um, so this talks about the national indicators, milestones and future trends. So this is very much the kind of evidence base um, that, you know, is sort of collected as part of um, delivering the legislation so that we know whether we are indeed achieving um, the national wellbeing goals and we are considering the future trends that are, are most important to us. In terms of making it happen then, so as I mentioned, the wellbeing duty um, falls to 44 public bodies in Wales, including Welsh Government. It also falls to the um, public service boards as well, um, and also some of the larger community councils. So all the local authorities in Wales are covered by this, um, as indeed are the health boards and, um, as I mentioned, some of the, the, the larger community councils. Underneath, um, so I'm on the almost the, the last um, row, uh, the five ways, ways of working that I already mentioned, which includes thinking about the long term, thinking very much about prevention, um, and the other three being collaboration, integration and involvement. So they really are the, um, obviously the ways of working. Um, so essentially how public bodies should be operating, how they should be thinking, planning, making decisions, etc., should be following these ways of working. And then finally, at the long term, 
in terms of the, the kind of accountability. Um, as I mentioned, um, the legislation established the Future Generations Commission's role. Um, and we also work really closely with the Auditor General for Wales, um, who has um, obviously an audit and accountability role as well. I'm going to try and speed up because I can see the time ticking by. So um, I mentioned the public bodies that um, are included in the Act already. So the Welsh ministers, the Welsh government, local authorities, health boards and some of the national bodies as well are listed on this slide. So as I say, the, the Act was introduced um, five years ago and our office was established five years ago. Um, so really now is a good time to kind of reflect on where we are five years on. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that the Act is all about addressing long term challenges and obviously climate change um, is, you know, one of the major challenges for current and future generations. And the Act also allows us to address long term challenge challenges in a, in a really holistic way. So thinking about the impact and the benefits across all dimensions of well-being. So I just thought I'd start with um, giving you some kind of national examples of the um, impact that the Act has had, um, really looking at, at the kind of Welsh Government um, approach. We've been working really closely with them over the last five years. Um, and then Johnny's going to go on to talk about some, some local examples. Um, last year, um, 2020, we produced um, a really big report, Future Generations Report, um, and within that, we did um, we we did sort of see that there has been a, you know a, a big change in terms of political commitment to the act, um, and in resulting policy decisions um, five years on. Although we still see challenges in relation to consistency of approaches across the various policy areas, but I thought I'd just highlight. Um, so Welsh, we had a, a Welsh government elections a few months ago, um, and the new, new synod was was um, elected and a new government, um, and then they have to set their, their wellbeing ob objectives. And this is one of their objectives, which is to embed our response to the climate and nature emergency in everything we do. So I think, you know, that just shows that the government are really serious um, and have a really high level commitment to tackling the climate and nature emergencies, which is, which is really great to see. So some of the kind of key aspects in terms of net zero policy in future generations, um, We've, you know, the Welsh government declared a climate emergency back in 2019. Um, they've set, they've set carbon budgets um, and will publish their net zero plan very soon. But their approach um, around decarbonisation is really aligned to the Wellbeing Future Generations Act, both in terms of the kind of ways of working and looking at cont contributing across all seven wellbeing goals, which is really positive. In Wales, we also have a 2030 um, commitment for the public sector to be carbon neutral which is again really exciting and also we have the 2050 net zero Wales target. Um, over the last few years we've seen big progress in terms of investing in public transport and active travel. Wales is number three in the world in terms of recycling and earlier this year they um, published their um, Beyond Recycling it's called, so their, their latest um, zero waste strategy. Um, we've also seen an increase in terms of decarbonisation of spend over the last two years as well. Um, and on, on the right hand um, of the slide, there's um, a picture of a 10 point plan um, to fund a climate emergency that um, we published a few years ago. And the idea around that was that it's great to have um, policies in place, but we also need to see um, Welsh Government committing to investment and you know, the spending decisions need to align with the climate emergency as well. So just quickly, some of the work that we've been doing at um, national level over the last few years, we've worked on the planning policy of Wales. So that's been completely um, redrafted to make sure that um, people and places and achieving well-being through placemaking is at the, the heart of, of planning policy, which is really exciting. Um, we've worked on um, housing retrofit and skills. Um, for the future in terms of the green recovery. We've also done a big piece of work on um, pr procuring wellbeing in Wales because, you know, we see procurement as another key lever in terms of how public bodies could be um, thinking differently and um, making different decisions in terms of spending that, that money on procurement. And just finally from me, just wanted to highlight that I think transport has been a real success story for us over the last few years. So, um, back in 2016, the, the Welsh Government had plans to build a relief road around Newport, which is uh, southeast Wales. 
Um, we published a piece of work looking at transport fit for future generations. Um, and then luckily for us in 2019, the first minister made the decision that actually they would not be going ahead with that. And they scrapped um, those plans for that, um, for that relief road. And since then, we've worked with them really closely on a new transport strategy, which is called Llwybr Newe, the new path. Um, that was published earlier this year. Um, and it has the sustainable transport hierarchy very much at the centre of it. Um, it also has targets around modal shift um, and a real focus on sustainable transport um, in terms of the, you know, the future for Wales. The other thing we've seen recently is that they've also announced that they will be suspending all future road building plans and they've set up a, a panel to look at, um, at this specific issue. So that's um, another really exciting development, I think, and really shows how the Act is helping them to make these decisions around um, net zero and, and you know, low carbon um, in a really holistic way. So I think that's it for me. I'm going to hand over to Johnny to talk about the local um, examples. Um, and I'm happy to, to move on the slides if you just give me a prod, Johnny. Yeah, definitely loud, um, Edgine. Um, thanks, everyone, for um, joining. Yeah, if I could have the next slide, please, Edgine. Um, it's not an easy thing to follow Edgine because she's been really looking and analysing climate policy in Wales for quite a few years and is a real expert um, in-house. I think Edgar would agree with me, we're seeing Welsh ministers, so at a national level, the Act is really starting to be used and we're seeing it at the front of centre of lots of new big policy announcements coming through and then when it comes to local level we're seeing really bright spots of action by local authorities and health boards and others but there's plenty of room to grow and we're wanting to see much more acceleration at that local level. What I've done here, there's just three examples of sort of different ways of working really that the Act has spurred amongst um, local stakeholders. So Cardiff and Vale University Health Board have been looking at how to connect climate change goals under the Act and, and environment and resilience goals with mental health and well-being. So we love this example because it's about using the health board estate um, to protect and enhance nature to bring on these other kind of benefits for patient um, mental health and well-being. We've got a slide at the end which has got links to all of these case studies in detail, but I just wanted to kind of like highlight a few. So um, great stuff with um, Cardiff and Vale um, Health Board. Then with Gwent Climate Action, um, this is an example of public service um, boards and public bodies working together. So one of the things that the Act brought about was the creation of these regional public service boards. So all the public um, bodies working together in one region. And in, in Gwent, actually, this is Gwent. Um, um, I think I've got the name wrong here. Sorry, it's um, uh, Gwent Ready for um, Climate. Um, but they've been um, developing these climate assemblies. Edgar and I were having a look at a successful climate assembly in Blind Eye Gwent. And it was really interesting to note the ideas coming through from these citizen panels. Um, around active travel being one of the, the, the biggest issues that um, the community wanted to have um, addressed. Um, the public bodies work together and there's 62 new electric vehicle infrastructure um, uh, uh, places uh, there in Gwent, thanks to this collaborative way of working. A Sputty Gwynedd, there's a really interesting example for us. So a hospital um, in North Wales, where 80 of the staff have come together, they've looked at the well-being goals and developed um, their strategy um, uh, for the hospital. Really exciting ideas coming through, including they're currently working with local farmers around local food um, procurement, or very much uh, an aspiration under the Act, um, and this 10-year strategy that the estate itself will um, supply fruit and vegetable and be, uh, the hospital will become self-sufficient in those foods over 10 years and lots more um, examples coming through there as well. So we've seen how the Act has um, created a, a group of kind of green champions within the hospital and actually this model is working so well they're actually advising um, other parts of the public sector in Wales um, around what you can do when you bring the workforce together under the Act. Um, next slide please, Edgine. Um, and I'll try and um, move on quickly. Um, Cardiff Council 
Um, what we like here in terms of the joined up thinking about ways to address climate is actually bringing in public health officials to co-design a local transport um, strategy so that we are tackling issues around air pollution, congestion and obesity in one go. So we're seeing um, a pedestrian line pedestrianized areas around primary schools. We're seeing um, the implementation of new drainage um, systems here in Grangetown, if you're familiar with Cardiff, where I'm living right now. Um, and that has been integrated with improving local cycle paths and footpaths. Really great example and a health charter for the 35,000 um, staff um, in the public sector um, in Cardiff to encourage more um, active travel. Behind that, there are great stories around increased investment, particularly in Cardiff, around um, active travel. Um, it's not Amsterdam quite yet, but um, I think the aspiration is to, to move towards it. Um, next slide, please, Akon. Um, I'll be really quick here, just kind of um, looking at the, the wealth of materials we've been developing on the progress local authorities, public bodies are making on the act. There's some kind of key things coming through and no doubt you'll be familiar with them um, as well. We are seeing increased um, action, but despite this progress, we are seeing that in particular public bodies can go further to protect and enhance nature um, under the kind of climate and nature crisis, which have been um, officially declared actually by the, um, the Senate here in Wales. Um, slow culture change, this is a big, um, um, issue for us. So um, how do we sort of inspire and motivate the kind of leadership of the future we need for the Act? One of the responses our commissioner has had our office is to establish a Future Generations Leadership Academy. Uh, really interesting programme. It's now going into its second year, raising lots of funds from the private sector too, but training young leaders that are about to go into senior positions in public bodies, training them in the act. And it's been quite inspirational to see um, how much demand there is out there for this type of program to do leadership skills around sustainable development. Um, and they really are becoming these champions within the public bodies that we need. Um, public bodies, though, have been quite clear um, to us and to Welsh government that they want more and clear guidance on how to implement um, the Act. Um, and there was an interesting insight from um, a Senate um, committee recently that public bodies could be doing more to um, work in a multi-stakeholder approach um, around net zero, and we're seeing increased appetite there. Um, next slide, please, um, Edgain. And I think we are um, um, uh, moving uh, uh, against kind of um, time, but I'll try and speed up. Um, there is a globally responsible Wales goal as well. So the public sector and the Welsh government um, have a legal duty to make sure that um, Wales is becoming a globally responsible nation. One example of this is, as we're seeing with Wales um, prioritising a national forest um, at home, we are supporting Uganda um, with uh, a, a huge tree planting um, uh, program um, there. Next slide, please, Edgain. Um, I think these are now just a few future challenges. So we've got the act, um, it's groundbreaking, it's making conversations happen that otherwise wouldn't. But like the rest of you, we've got these major challenges um, uh, ahead of us. Just really quickly on the National Nature Service idea. This is a new idea we're developing with partners and it's around addressing job creation in environmental management. And one of the things that our research is showing us is how few jobs um, are going to women and how few jobs are going to um, uh, members of black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities around environmental management. And so we're wanting to see this creation of pipeline of opportunities to increase the diversity of those entering um, environmental management jobs. Next slide, please, Edgain. Um, oh, this is yours, Ava Goyne. Right. Yeah, I'll quickly explain this one then. Um, a piece of work that we've um, done over the last 10 months around um, the retrofit challenge, so decarbonising homes, we focused on um, working out how much investment is needed. So there's um, almost 15 billion of investment needed to retrofit uh, all homes in Wales by 2030, which is a, a large, scary figure. But because we, um, you know, we consider this through the lens of the Act, what we what we've done as well is to obviously 
try and pull, uh, pull out the and highlight the, the benefits that this would achieve. Um, so through the work that we've done, we've been able to um, show that actually it would create 19 billion of additional GDP, um, 3 billion tax benefits, 26,500 new jobs by 2030, um, on top of all the kind of environmental and health benefits as well. So I just wanted to, to use that as a, as a quick example. Thanks. And I think this is our last challenge as well, is engaging business. So I mentioned already that um, there's um, this issue of, you know, how public bodies could be working more in a multi-stakeholder um, approach. And um, private sector in Wales isn't covered by the Act. They're obviously critical if we're to get to net zero. Um, and the Commissioner and our office have been challenging Welsh Government to think about overall better coordination and convening of the private sector, despite a lack of maybe organisation of business around um, net zero in Wales. There are as you can imagine, a huge amount of businesses doing really interesting things. And we're seeing more and more businesses aligning their strategies, their actions and investments um, to the Act. And we think that's only going to grow because, as we mentioned, with Welsh Government really putting the Act at the, 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 the kind of forefront of the policies they're doing, we're seeing that now in economic strategy and also in business support. So you know, the, the sort of writings on the wall, if you like, for the private sector in Wales, increasingly, if you're going to access public funds, you're going to have to be demonstrating your actions on the Act. And um, we have this economic contract of principles that businesses need to sign up to to access public funds. I've seen the latest version of that, and it's going to increase demand um, to prove that businesses are taking action around net zero. We have this foundational economy approach as well, so trying to keep the Welsh pound within Wales. Um, lots of opportunities there. Um, we're seeing uh, the growth of um, uh, uh, local authorities looking at local food pro um, procurement from SMEs. What we want to see is that we're not just doing local food supply, but local sustainable food supply, and the public sector can be putting these um, extra conditions potentially on the private sector to act and really interesting um, action around a circular economy so we're seeing Welsh government funding going into SMEs that are coming up with zero waste strategies with really good recycling strategies so uh, we think this is an exciting area and actually we'd be really interested to learn from um, authorities across the UK where they've really been able to integrate local business and SMEs um, in their work I think the last slide, Airgain, yeah, is our resources. So lots here, and I'm sure we'll be sharing this presentation with you um, afterwards, but really good resources on the local authorities um, taking um, uh, lots, of, lots of action around um, net zero. Um, and I think I'll, I'll end there, and sorry, we've taken a bit more time maybe than we thought. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much. Um, maybe useful for people to know that you do have an expo booth as well, um, if they want to have a look at that later on. Um, we've got a few questions come through for you. Um, I'll just invite Bridget, if she'd like to unmute herself or um, share her audio and video and ask a question yourself. Are you able to do that, Bridget? Or shall I ask the question for you? Okay, I'm not seeing anything popping up, so I'll ask. Um, Bridget's asking, well, there's a couple of questions from her, but I'll look at the second one first. Um, she's asking about the final point on the lessons learned about public bodies not doing enough to realize the potential um, of private, she says. Can you elaborate on this? Is there a reference to local authorities? What's the opportunity? Yeah, do you want, do you want me to come in on that, Ergang? It yeah, was, yeah, it was a finding from a Senate Public Accounts Committee back in March um, this year. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of five, six years on from, from the Act, the, um, the, the committee was saying, you know, that they wanted to see a lot more action um, by public bodies at local level uh, around kind of um, all of the goals. Um, and it really struck us this insight of the committee saying, there's much more that you can achieve kind of working through um, the private sector. So we have seen some really good examples, particularly around food procurement, Carfilly um, local authority is really interesting to look at in terms of 
investing in local SMEs for the school meals, food and procurement um, for the public body. Um, and we think that is a really good example, but it, um, it, it tends to be, I don't know, Ergon, if you'd agree, more of an outlier um, than uh, the norm. So I think there's a, a certainly something that we need to do in the office or consider with Welsh Government, which is what's the kind of guidance that you can get out to um, the public um, bodies around ways of working um, with the private sector locally. And of course, it's not just food in terms of the skills agenda, in terms of renewable energy, um, there's so many issues around net zero where we could be seeing more collaboration with the private sector. But it, I, I, I think we would take it on as an office ourselves as, as agreeing there's a gap there in terms of guidance. Uh, so we're, we're really interested in learning more from others. We know that there are great pockets of progress around private sector engagement in local authorities across the UK. So we need a bit of a time and space probably to kind of think that through a bit more, but I'm probably waffling now, but we'd be really interested if you've got ideas and pointers to other places doing this um, well, thanks. Can I just ask, do you, do you see kind of guidance documents as being the best way to share those experiences between places that are ahead or do you have other ideas for different kind of fora and things where people could meet to share those experiences? Yeah, I'll give one thought and then hand over to Edgar. I really like the Asputi Gwynedd example where 80 NHS staff in the hospital have come together inspired by the act and they are turning their group into this sort of um, knowledge hub and innovation hub and coming up with those ideas. So yes, does the world need another report from our office or Welsh government on guidance? Or actually, is it creating this network and connecting champions, leaders, inspirers and building that network? But over to you, Eirgain. Yeah, no, I'd agree. I think, you know, we, we need to find far more innovative ways of being able to sort of share um, best practice or, you know, case studies and, and learning with each other than just producing guidance document after guidance document. So, um, yeah, I definitely be in the camp of um, trying to trying to inspire um, people by by showing what's possible um, and yeah, finding better ways of um, bringing people together. Um, so is that part of the commissioner's office's role or is that some does that sit somewhere else do you think um so we, yeah we we obviously try and do what we can we are an incredibly small team there's uh, only around 20 of us and we we work with um you know across Welsh government and with 43 other public bodies as well so i think you know um you know potentially working with thousands and thousands of, of public sector staff so we do, yeah we just don't have capacity obviously to to be able to do everything um but you know collaboration and partnership working is is the key here really so um i think that's where we have got we, we are in a good position because we do um work across so many different sectors across so many different organizations that we are able to um make those connections between maybe the more un unusual suspects um, and bring different thinking um and different different sort of people together yeah Okay, thank you. Um, Nolan is asking a question about what you think the balance is between forcing people, citizens, to change their modes of travel, more active travel, versus consultation and educating. Uh, and he's saying they've seen huge backlashes against the low traffic neighbourhoods, for example. Oh, interesting question. Um, I'll just yeah answer it quickly from from my perspective. And fortunately, in Wales, we've suffered um, hugely from lack of investment in public transport and active travel um, over the last couple of decades. So we really are playing catch up. Um, we've got ministers now in place who are very ambitious. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the new strategy published earlier this year, um, you know, basically huge commitments that we haven't seen in the past. Um, and obviously that needs to be um, supported with increased investment. So, just an, as an example, five years ago, I think they were spending around five million a year on active travel, which is, you know, it, next to nothing really. And this year, um, the budget is around 75 million for active travel. So, um, you know, we've seen huge shifts um, and we, you know, we know we need to, to invest in that infrastructure. We know we need to put those 
um, more sustainable travel um, options and, and opportunities, um, make them you know a lot more available to a lot more people. Um, otherwise, people will just continue to jump in their car and drive around the place. You know, it's it's, it's you know it's not that difficult. So, um, you know, our our kind of um, preference would be obviously to to think across all the all the well being goals and to think about how we do this in a way that people see it. You know, it improves um, their health. You know, it it gets us to a more resilient Wales if people are um, traveling in in low carbon modes of transport. So. Um, I know Welsh Government are looking at um, things like road user charging potentially. Um, they've, as I mentioned, they've set up this panel now to look at um, the whole kind of um, road building infrastructure. So, yeah, I think, you know, things are moving in the right direction, but um, yeah, it's it's going to take a while. Okay. Um, you mentioned climate assemblies in Gwent, I think. Are you aware of others and what sort of scales have those been? undertaken at is that all at county scale or any at town or district level that you're aware of? The so the Blaine Gwent um climate assembly was established um I believe earlier this year um and that is at uh, a local authority level or a county borough level um and actually it's quite interesting that that was um taken forward by the housing associations coming together um because they you know have a, a big focus on decarbonisation in terms of existing homes as well as um, new homes. Um, they worked with the, with the local authority and, and a few other organisations actually to to develop that climate assembly. Uh, I'm not aware of any others um, happening in Wales, although um, you know we are sort of trying to to prod Welsh government in, in that direction in terms of looking at um, you know some kind of engagement mechanism at, at a more national level uh, to consider these issues. There was an extra in Cannon Valley, sorry. Um, but yeah. there's a really nice overview of the Blind Eye Gwent um, Climate Assembly, which I'll try and post in the chat. Thank you. But you're, you're pushing more for a national kind of climate assembly, are you, rather than more local ones? Is that what I mean? Um, well, I think you put, we probably need both, to be honest, don't we? Um, I'm just conscious that Welsh Government made a commitment um, in their low carbon plan a couple of years ago to to look at, the, you know, the whole issue around climate justice. Um, and I know they've been looking at what Scotland are doing around the Just Transition Commission. Um, and again, because their approach around net zero, um, you know, the advice they get from the UK Committee on Climate Change, um, the approach they're trying to take is is a lot more holistic in terms of considering you know issues across all dimensions of well-being so things like the just tran transition agenda i know is is really um really important to them so i think yeah we need something at national level but, but potentially um lo local level as well to feed in thanks um another question from nolan is um, do you think local and regional governments should be pushing the notion that citizens are part of the environment rather than our impact on the environment with humans not being a separate entity? Interesting point. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, involvement is, is one of the ways of working within the Act and it's one of the... Um, ways of working that public bodies well actually as as well as thinking about the long term that that, that is another one but it seems to be the one that they um, have been struggling with um, a little bit over the last few years to find you know mechanisms to genuinely engage with people so that they can really um, you know be part of the kind of thinking and decision making process at you know as early stage as possible it's it's you know really quite difficult um but i yeah i think it's interesting to, to think about um you know that we are dependent on nature um on you know on ecosystems in in so many ways that um yeah people i guess don't always think about that in terms of the kind of land use the food the air the water all of those natural resources so, um, yeah, I think it's it's an interesting an interesting um, thought to to take forward. 
Okay. Um, another quick one. Uh, we've just got a couple of minutes left, but um, Hazel Graham's asking what happens to local authorities if you find out they're not weaving the act through all policy, place making, commissioning, etc. Well, we tell them off. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, that's another really interesting question and people are always quite interested in, um, you know, how much teeth does the commissioner actually have? Um, so I guess unfortunately we probably don't have um, strong enough powers that, that we would like to have. Um, as I mentioned right at the beginning, we work quite closely with the Auditor General for Wales. They carry out audits on public bodies, you know, all the time um, and they are as part of that programme, they're, you know, they are weaving in the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act um, into the work that they do. So they also consider how big bodies are thinking about all the, you know, all the five ways of working, how they're contributing to the seven national wellbeing goals, etc. Um, so, yeah, we, you know, we're in the, um, very much in the early days, you know, we wanted to very much provide advice and support to um, government and, and public bodies um, to show them what could be done um, as time is moving on and if we, we're not seeing or we're not convinced that the change is happening quickly enough, um, you know, we will be moving, we are moving into more of a kind of challenging space. Um, so, in, you know, a very early example was the M4 relief road I mentioned. Um, we, you know, submitted evidence to the public inquiry. We worked on um, research to show how that investment could be done differently um, in terms of, you know, investing in transport fit for future generations. Um, and, you know, we were lucky with that decision that um, the First Minister decided to, um, to scrap, scrap the whole thing. So, you know, we have got examples of where um, things are changing. Um, just to quickly mention as well, one of the strongest powers that the Commissioner does have as part of the legislation is her Section 20 powers. So we carried out a Section 20 review of procurement across public bodies um, over the last few years. Um, and as part of that, we published a report with some recommendations around what we'd like public bodies to be doing. Um, and we will be following that up very closely um, over the coming years. Um, we haven't got as much scope in terms of, you know, what do we do if they don't listen to us or if they don't take forward the recommendations. Um, so, yeah, we're just going to have to see how, how things go with that, really. OK, thank you. Um, Leslie is asking about the how realistic the, the goal of getting rid of all gas boilers by 2030 is, so I suppose. Was that taken account of the practicalities in that analysis? Um, asking is the technology available what about the skills gap yeah really really good question and um, yeah the whole kind of retrofit challenge is is complicated there are so many different elements to it and um, even though the work that we did kind of focused just on the on the finance you know we're very much aware that you know there are so many parts to this jigsaw that and everything needs to kind of come together um, and align and, and, and work um, work kind of seamlessly together somehow so you know I think it's helpful that the minister um that was a, a quote from the minister um she made an announcement back in the summer around this I think it's really helpful that we have these um high level commitments one of the things we've called for in our report is that we need this long-term plan to get us you know to, to these you know low carbon homes you know over the next 20 years um, it's not going to happen in the next five years. You know, we need this 20 year plan. And that includes looking at things like what technology do we need? You know, do we have um, access to that, you know, to the to the to the equipment, to the kit? Um, you know, where is all of that going to come from? Um, are we, you know, are we going to look to buy it all in from China? Are we going to try and develop um, local supply chains in Wales to be able to, to fulfill that um, need? And the skills issue is, is huge as well. And, you know, we've been looking at that as a team. There are so many opportunities around, you know, green jobs um, linked to the green recovery. Um, but we need, you know, Welsh Government and, you know, the HEFE providers to be building those um, training programmes right now to be able to fill, you know, fulfil those um, skills needs that we, you know, we're going to have to um, fill over the next sort of 10, 20 years. So, um, yeah, it's complicated, but 
you know, it needs doing. So we've got to we've got to get on with it. Thanks. Uh, and another kind of link in there in terms of technology. Nolan is asking, do you think local and regional and local slash regional governments are set up to adopt and procure new technology to achieve net zero? E.g. waste, for example, is the CTO role. I'm not sure what CTO, the chief technical officer um, role in local governments helping or is, is it an uphill battle? Oh, I, <laughs> I was hoping Johnny might be able to take a question because I feel like I've been rabbiting on for the last uh, 20 minutes. But that is a procurement question, which is uh, kind of my bag. So, um, oh, it's yeah. I mean, procurement is such a, a big opportunity, but, you know, such a such a, a big challenge as well. Um, I, I guess from our perspective and, you know, again, this is where we need to learn from what's happening elsewhere um, across the UK, really. Things are beginning to, to sort of move in the right direction um, for us here in Wales. So local authorities are working more um, regionally and, you know, they're, they're coming together with other public sector bodies as part of the public service board. Um, structures as well and um, we've got people from organizations like Claire's um, working with PSBs to, to look at um, you know what they can do in terms of procuring more locally so things are happening but yeah the, there's an awful lot still to be done and I think it's this kind of alignment of everything that needs to happen around the kind of skills the technology the procurement you know the collaboration it's yeah it all needs to come together, but um, yeah, we're probably not there yet. Great, thank you very much. I'm afraid we're out of time. There are a couple more questions which may have been better suited to Johnny, but I'm afraid we're not going to have time to get to those. Maybe you're spared by having to talk more about sustainable drainage. That might not have been so appealing. Um, thank you very much, both of you, for your, your time and your involvement. As I said before, you um, Future Generations Commission do have an expo booth, so go and have a look at that. Um, and there's opportunities for networking now for the next half hour or so before the next session starts. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us, and hope you enjoy the rest of the um, morning and afternoon early. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.